Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good morning, everybody. It's nice to see uh, a good turnout this uh, fresh, early start. Uh, I'm Stuart Tansley. Uh, senior Research Program Manager in Microsoft Research Connections, your, your, your host today. Um, uh, as those of you that saw my, my talk with Anup uh, Gupta yesterday, um, we introduced the Connect for Windows SDK beta uh, from Microsoft Research. And uh, today, uh, we're going to get into more of the technicalities of the, uh, the SDK um, and hopefully give you some, some kind of uh, learning experience uh, teaching you how to use the SDK. Uh, we don't have a, such a hands-on environment today. We don't have connects for you for, for, to try and, but, but you can follow along the tutorial that uh, um, my colleague uh, Gavin uh, Janke is going to uh, uh, present to you. A few words about Gavin. Um, uh, I mentioned yesterday the, the, the team behind the SDK has been awesome to work with. Very high quality individuals. We hope that's uh, commensurate with a, a very high quality SDK. But, but Gavin uh, is a 20 year veteran in the, in the company, a general manager now running all of the engineering uh, group in Microsoft Research. Um, he managed to fit in the SDK in his spare time with his uh, development team, as, as much of us did. Uh, Gavin used to, to work in the, uh, the, the, the technical uh, office of uh, Bill Gates. Uh, much like Anup Gupta. We just learned uh, that uh, we were both at Loughborough University at a similar period uh, back in England, so that was an interesting uh, factoid. Uh, Gavin, though, um, for me, is apart from the SDK now, is most known for uh, the Microsoft Tag. And um, Microsoft Tag, I knew that it had made it. It's this little thing like the, the QR code, but, but I think a lot prettier. Um, uh, he is the creator of the tag and um, was the first engineer on the, on the tag system. So you see this tag pretty much in many magazines. Uh, I, was, I thought he made it when I, I saw it in the front of uh, USA Today. So every day, Gavin is there in the front of USA Today. So I think that's pretty awesome. So without further ado, let me hand over to, uh, to Gavin Janke, General Manager uh, for Engineering in Microsoft Research. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Um, so um, today I'm going to show you how um, to use the SDK, kind of some high-level concepts, and then start digging down into you know, how easy it is to actually create a um, Connect-based application um, with the development kit. Um, I ran the engineering for the SDK, um, which started in earnest around the beginning of March with a 14-week timeline. So it was a very intense 14 weeks, starting from um, the Xbox console code and actually porting it over to the PC, which required a lot of work, um, given their fundamentally different computer architectures. So despite its intensity, it was also one of the most fun engineering projects I've worked on in my history in the company. Um, so what we'll cover today, we'll cover just very slightly the Kinect sensor, um, the different kinds of cameras that are in the device itself, and then getting down into the details, how do we um, interact and manipulate the data that comes off the device itself, such as um, the depth data, how do we do elementary skeletal tracking, and then um, audio from the device itself. So looking at the thing, um, the Kinect itself, inside we have a standard RGB camera, um, <coughs> so simple CMOS device giving us VGA, or slightly higher re resolution. Um, we have 3D depth sensors. So the way the depth sensors work, the thing on the left there is actually a, a low power IR laser, which is a class one laser um, in the infrared spectrum. And then the sensor on the right is actually the IR detector. Um, so laser bounces light off me and essentially back to the device. So it can determine based on you know, the time that the laser bounces back, essentially the depth of the field that it's looking at. Also internally, the Kinect has four microphones um, to, to form a microphone array. Um, and actually, this is one of the best um, microphone arrays on the market. Um, and as I start talking about audio, um, a, microway, mic a mic array is a very powerful um, um, system for actually getting crystal clear audio, especially when you do sound source localization and things like that. 
And then the final little goodie that's in the device is a motor, which is in the base of the device itself, which allows you know, pitch changes um, so that the field of view vertically can be changed. So this is essentially the SDK architecture, and I'm going to work through from the bottom up. Um, and this is a classic you know, device, driver, uh, runtime, application architecture. So when we start at the bottom, so the Connect itself um, <coughs> actually contains a three or more, I think three or four USB devices it, itself internally. So there's the cameras themselves, so the VGA camera, um, the 3D camera, the audio microarray, um, and motor control. And there's actually a USB, a miniature USB hub in the device itself. So, and then that itself plugs into um, you know, the PC architecture USB. Um, now, because of the number of uh, USB devices through that small USB hub that's on the device, um, Connect needs to be on its own USB host controller uh, on the laptop or PC. And generally, PCs and laptops have at least two or so USB host controllers internally. So as we move up the, the stack here, so <coughs> this essentially is the device driver stack. Um, and so it's a classic uh, Windows USB architecture. So we have you know, the USB audio stack on the right, um, which also you know, is split between user mode and kernel mode. Um, so on the user mode side, it allows us to control you know, the stream itself, configuration values. Then we have the USB uh, camera stack, um, again, where we control you know, video streams, um, properties, res resolutions, that kind of thing. Um, and then other things, such as the motor control um, and aspects like that. And all of those interact with um, the just released kernel mode drivers for the Connect, S the Connect device itself for Windows. Once we move up, um, so essentially, uh, this is what my team worked on for the, the 14 weeks. Um, the Xbox team provided us with uh, the kernel mode uh, SDK drivers for the device itself. So in the orange there, um, <coughs> essentially you can think of the Connect is split into kind of two sets of APIs. So when you plug the Connect into Windows, um, it automatically recognizes it as a standard Windows audio device. So from your perspective, you don't really need to use anything special audio API-wise um, because Windows will expose and surface the, you know, the, the full microarray micro through the standard Windows API. But we do provide what we call a DMO, which is a DirectX media object, um, giving you advanced control over sound source localization, echo cancellation, gain control, and so on. So that essentially goes up um, in the gray area box, which is the standard Windows core APIs. And on the left-hand side, we have what we call the NUI API, so the Natural User Interface API. And essentially, this is the runtime and the API, which allows full control and access to the other goodies on the Connect device itself. So motor control, VGA camera, death, control, uh, death camera, and so on. And then you build your applications on top of this runtime itself. So essentially, that is the Connect SDK architecture. So what I'm going to do now is um, show you how to use the cameras programmatically um, in terms of how do I get access to the VGA feed? How do I get access to the depth stream? What do I do with the depth stream? That kind of stuff. So. Um, I can give you a quick little demo here, which is um, the skeletal viewer application that is one sample that comes in the SDK itself. And if we start it up there, I should really hide my toolbar. But, um, so essentially, top left is the depth stream that is coming off the camera itself. Um, and the depth stream allows tracking up to four players, um, but only skeletal tracking for up to two because of computation and other complexity um, constraints there. And so if a second player was to come up here, um, they would be colored as a different person in the left. On the right-hand side, um, this is our skeletal guy. Um, 
So the Nui runtime itself is actively tracking my skeleton. Um, if, the if the Kinect camera was pointing down, then it would um, show my feet, and Stuart's going to <laughs> come up as a second person here. Yay. And there's Good Stuart. Voice. So we have two skeletons and two depth players that are being actively tracked. Thank you. And then the bottom right-hand screen is the standard VGA feed that's coming off the device. And this is running at a full 30, second, 30 frames per second frame rate. Um, and it consumes a very small amount of the CPU on the device itself. So that is our little um, camera demo, essentially showing you all the features together in one application itself. So in terms of um, the depth data, actually probably the best thing for me to do now is jump into how do I get the VGA feed off the device and render it to a screen. So um, what I'm going to do is open Visual Studio. And these are simple little demos. So um, I'm going to get rid of the magnifier because this screen is rather large. Um, so really easy to create. I'm going to create a Visual Studio project, which is a WPF application. And I'm just going to use the defaults WPF application 2. Um, create the project. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add a single reference which is to our Connect SDK Managed Wrappers. So Microsoft Research Connect. Add that as a reference. Um, and what I'm going to do here is essentially put a little image control um, on the WPF surface. And let's set some resolution here. So height. I'm just going to do standard 320 by 240. Like that. So we have a 320 by 240 um, image there. And then I'm going to move over to the actual um, code itself. So I'll close this. And we're going to look at some C sharp here. So what we're going to do is use our Microsoft.Research.Connect.Nui namespace. Um, and in our main window, essentially what we're going to do is um, we're going to do runtime. So we're going to create the Nui runtime. We'll call it Nui equals new runtime, just like that. So we're going to instantiate our Nui runtime uh, once the class is created. Um, now I need a couple of um, events, um, obviously when the actual thing itself fires. Um, let's see, how do we do this? So we're going to add ourselves an onload event. Uh, I'm going to fix the errors here. So, so now I'm going to create an event which will be onloaded. Like that. And then I'm going to do something similar, unloaded. So what we want to do is, so when the application loads, um, essentially I'm going to do a new initialize. And I'm going to tell it that I wish to get access to the color stream itself like that. And obviously, um, we want to be good citizens and uninitialize the connective device once we're done so that it frees up the resources so another application can use it afterwards. So essentially, what I've done is I've instantiated the runtime object. I'm initializing Nui to give me a color stream. And then next, what I'm going to do is um, open the video stream, saying that I wish to get video. Now, pool size is the number of internal buffers that it used to queue the data. So the larger the number, the smoother um, the streaming that comes in, but also the larger the latency. So two is good. 
pretty good number to use there. So image resolution, and I'm going to pick 640 by 480, and then image type is just a standard color image type. Now also what I want to do though is I need an event handler to tell me when an image frame is actually ready to be consumed. So what we say is video frame ready plus equals, and it doesn't get easier than this. With a couple of tabs, we got our event handler right there. So <coughs> what happens now is um, essentially we create our event handler, we've opened the video stream, and we're going to get events which are going to be fired into this new video frame ready. Um, so essentially now what I'm going to do is um, we have our image, which I created on the WPF form, and I simply assign its source to um, the image frame itself that's returned in image frame ready event args. Um, so essentially what we do here is I create a new bitmap source. Oops. Um, and I'm creating an image, and I say I want to create a 320 by 240 image, um, and standard 96 um, dots per inch uh, display. Um, so pixel format is essentially going to be uh, BGR32, so blue, green, red, 32, um, including alpha, which is an unused thing in this specific scenario. We don't use a palette because we're using full um, the full 32 uh, bits of the image that comes in, so we don't need to do anything like that. Um, so in event args, what I should have done here is actually unpack them um, from that. So it comes back as a, a planar image. Um, IMG equals, and then essentially E dot image frame dot image. So we've unpacked the image from the event arguments here. So now I can use that here, saying IMG dot bits. So we pass in the bits that have come off the device into that event handler. Um, and the stride, uh, so this is a an image concept, so the stride essentially is the width in, um, in bytes of the image itself with any padding information on the end. Um, so in this sense, it's image.width um, times by the number of bytes per pixel in the image itself. And essentially, this application is all I needed to do to get the data off the VGA data off the device and render it into a little box on the screen. So let's see what we get here. And essentially, there I am if the device was slightly further down. So literally with those five lines of code, I was able to create an application in Windows Presentation Foundation um, to get VGA off the device and render it onto display. So it doesn't get easier than that. So, but going back to our presentation here. Um, so now let's talk about depth data. So what you saw there was VGA data. So depth data is another media form that comes off the device. Um, <coughs> and in a way, it's exactly the same as an image in terms of concept. So, you know, X, Y matrix. Um, but instead of color pixel information, it comes back with um, a depth represented in millimeters of an object, whatever it is, um, in relation to the IR laser itself. And so, similar concept, everything comes back as an event, and you unpackage that from the event arguments. Um, and the distance data comes back from the device packed into um, 16 bits, so two bytes. Um, and depending on what you're asking the device to give to you, you unpack that in a different way. Now you might say, oh my gosh, this is convoluted. Why am I shifting bits and bytes and stuff around? Um, when we set out to create the SDK, 
it was very important for us to maintain parity with the Xbox platform itself. So we didn't change that whatsoever, so people with familiarity with both um, don't have to learn different concepts. So we retained the API um, coherency, you know, all the way down to the bit level with the Xbox console implementation of Connect itself. So that was very important. Um, so you can request from the device saying, I just want the depth data that you're getting off the camera. Or you can say, I want you to also give me the depth data of specific people who are standing in front of the device. So when you ask for the people, essentially it identifies what we call the player index. So here's a little bit of Xbox console like conceptual stuff coming over to the PC platform. It essentially means person. So it will identify up to you know, player 0, 1 through 4 or 6 um, by unpacking you know, that from the first um, uh, three, three bytes there, or three bits off the first byte. So in terms of the reference, so the Connect um, runtime um, surfaces up ranges from 850 millimeters to 4,000 millimeters, so just under a meter to four meters. Um, and it gives us depth of values um, in that range. And anything closer, so anything like right in front of the device or two miles that way, what we, we call them clamped. So we clamp the distances to either 850, between the 850 range and the four meter range. Um, and everything in between isn't clamped. Um, and the depth values that are returned um, can be zero or the value itself. So zero means the Kinect can't figure out, rely, well, let's say deterministically if something is valid there. So if there's a, a piece of reflective glass or sunshine glare, it will say, this isn't valid, so I'm going to return zero as a value. And then the player index is zero, one, two, um, depending on how many people are standing in front of the device itself. So OK, so now I'm going to use the same demo. So we're just going to continue to build on that demo that I created. Um, and actually start rendering um, the depth data. So we'll go back to mainwindow.xaml. And I did actually want to clamp this thing down. So let's see if we can change the height of here. So 240 and the width. Like that. And OK, so yeah, it's doing auto. What I might do is to fit it, because my laptop essentially is resizing itself for this huge monitor, I'm going to make these smaller than actual. I need to turn off the uh, snap to grid here, because it's really messing around <laughs> with. Just move. There we go. Come on. Should have brought my rodent friend with me. OK. Well, I might come back to this in a moment and resize this thing. In fact, let's shrink this so I can get a good handle on things. Oh, it I means I'm going to have to mess around with it. Thanks for the offer, though. <laughs> All right, let's see what this ends up looking like. It may, yeah, darn it. OK, I shouldn't be doing on the fly XAML authoring here. All right, what I might do is just hand code this stuff here. Or even better, just go to a pre can version of it. OK. I lost my. Uh, what I'm going to 
do is just create a new one because I got it into, oh, I think it's because I'm debugging. Well, that would help, wouldn't it? Okay, so we're back in business, I think. So let's just create a new project. This will we'll fly through this. Okay, so let's throw up an image here. So that's image one. That will be our VGA feed. And this will be our depth feed because it's so easy to create connect stuff. Um, in Visual Studio, it will take us a snap to put this together. I need to add my reference to the connect SDK. Okay, so add our two events, which is loaded and unloaded. Okay, so in loaded here, we do newy.initialize. So in this um, scenario, essentially we're going to use color. Um, and also with the or operator, use depth. And we're going to video stream.open as we did before image stream type dot video <laughs> okay so that's our video stream before and so we're also going to open the depth stream dot open um, image stream type dot depth pool size image resolution so um, with the depth stream essentially um, we can get 320 by 240 off there um, and with the image type um, is going to be depth and actually what I might do is um, continue along these lines um, and just get the player index too. Um, so now let's set up our events. Video stream ready plus equals that. And similarly, we'll set up our depth event handler. Just like that. So essentially we've done everything that we need to do um, to configure the device. Um, so we'll set the source equals to a new bitmap source. and then the stride itself. So that was the width. Um, and then times by bytes per pixel. Just like that. So essentially what we've got now is where we ended up before. Sorry for that little detour. Um, OK, so for the depth data, um, as I said, that comes back essentially in the same way. Um, and so what we do is we're also going to unpack the image um, from here too. Um, 
Okay. So <clears throat> in this scenario, what we're going to do is I'm going to draw the depth. Um, using um, a blended uh, set of RGB values in the grayscale um, domain. Um, so what I have to do essentially is because depth data isn't pixel data, I have to create an image based on the depth data. Um, so <coughs> what we're going to use is a, a pre-created static buf buffer um, that I'm going to create here. Um, which essentially is a 320 by 240 image um, like that. Um, and then also um, add a few constants here for the indexes um, of the colors themselves as we're assigning values into here. So this is going to be green. And then this offset is going to be blue. OK, so quickly, um, so we're going to walk the depth image. Um, and then we're going to populate um, the new video image itself. So I16 image.bits. Dot length Okay, so this is our main loop, which we're going to generate our new image. Um, and this is that unpacking sequence that I showed you in the slide before. Um, so this is unpacking the depth data from the player data too at the same time. And shifting it that way. So now I've extracted the depth data in millimeters from each byte um, x and y that comes from the depth sensor. Um, and then I'm just going to say, I'm going to create a value in the RGB space that makes sense to represent this um, as an image. So essentially, this is just a little scaling and mapping um, into this domain. Into intensity. And then essentially what we do is, um, so this is our new 32-bit image that we're creating here. Just like that. And then I'm just going to do this for green and blue. So that is our main loop, which generates a new image. And once we're done with that, um, we're going to essentially assign that to our image frame. Same 96 DPIs. Now, with the new bits that we just created for that image, with the correct stride. OK, so with any luck, what we'll get is a 
if Connect is doing its thing. Did I hook everything up correctly? Uh, let's have a look here. Let's have a look. Ah, depth and player index. Okay, so what I did there is my VGA feed is being rendered and this is the depth feed. So things that are very far away are very dark. Things that are much closer are much lighter. So essentially, very simple visualization of the depth data, you know, by creating a, a new image from uh, the information that's in the depth data into that domain. So we can get a little more cute. So, um, so let's say, well, I want to display things that are close in blue and things that are far, you know, based on the millimeters away that we are from there. Um, so what we can say is, um, I can say if real depth, um, you know, is less than 900 millimeters, so if we're really close, um, I can say I want to render everything in blue, let's say. Um, so to make this quick, let's do some cut and paste. Okay, and then I say if I want to um, display everything that's in the mid-range as a different color, then I can do that here. And essentially we'll just go like this. And remove the old code, which displayed everything in grayscale. So in this scenario, um, let's see, how did I sit there? OK, it's because I didn't set the different values there. So I said if the range is between 900 and the real depth is less than 2 meters, do that. Otherwise, display this. OK, so things that are far away, which are greater than 2 meters, are in blue. Things that are in the mid-range are green. And as we get closer, are red. So what I did there is manipulate the rendering based of the object from the Connect sensor itself. Um, and then the final thing we can do, essentially, is to also um, display the player index. So let's extract the player index um, from these bits here. And um, image.bits. And again, this is one of those unpacking operations. And what we do is we just mask out the stuff that we don't want, um, like that. And then I say, if player index is greater than 0. So if the pixels, that it, if the depth values that it's returning to me is part of the person being identified, then I'm going to display them in, let's say, yellow. So this is that coloring of um, person before. And then if it's not a player, then essentially we go back to normal rendering of stuff. Um, so let's see, I have to set that up slightly different. So if player index is greater than 0. Oh, OK. So one thing that you we need to do is also tell the runtime that um, we need to track a skeleton too, because then it turns on the internal skeleton tracking in, um, within the runtime. So it's colored me as yellow. If it doesn't detect me as a person or something like that, it's still tracking me. Cause <laughs> so it's, it's tracking me as a human. So if it wasn't, if, if there was something else out here by itself and it was close, well, it would track you as a person. Uh, so you can see some green in the bottom left there, uh, which it's tracking as a, an object which isn't a skeleton. So there you go. So now I've identified people from distances and objects and rendering them as different colors um, in there. 
OK, back to our tour um, of the features in the SDK. So the next thing is skeleton data. So <coughs> we haven't looked at that in the code yet. Again, it's very simple. Concepts are the same. We get events returned as um, you know, XYZ coordinates. So skeletal data, um, so the connect can track up to 20 joints. And those are the joints there. And essentially, it's a X, Y, and Z from the sensor. So if you imagine the, sensor, the, the infrared sensor, which is the right sensor on the device, is projecting a ray perfectly perpendicular out from its center there. Then X, Y, and Z is, relative, is a coordinate relative to that ray. So on this side, it's negative X. On this side, negative Y. Um, if it's above the device, then it's negative coordinate below the device, a positive coordinate. And then the Z is the depth data. Now, interestingly, the skeleton data is actually in meters as opposed to millimeters from the depth data. So that's the difference between getting, treating the connect as a, a raw device to give you depth data versus actual skeletal tracking itself. Um, in terms of the joints that it can track, so it can track two skeletons and give you the six-player proposal. So those proposals were that yellow unpacking that I did of an individual. I could have said if player equals one, two, and three, color them as different colors. Um, X, Y, and Z in meters. Um, so each joint has a track state. So if it's determined, well, that's a head, and that's a shoulder, and an arm, and an elbow, then it's in the track state. Um, if it's inferred, so, so let's say there's a bit of an occlusion of my you know, body part, so I'm off to the left. Connect can still interpolate where that joint is and give an inferred um, coordinate. Or if it's not tracked, then, which is a very rare event, um, essentially um, there's something uh, very off in terms of um, essentially you're completely off um, the device itself, so maybe only an arm. So those particular joints would be not tracked whatsoever because it can't even interpolate. Um, so when I was on the left and my arm was just showing up there, um, those other joints would likely be not tracked whatsoever. So the events they come back, um, essentially frame, nu frame number. So this is just like the other um, events that have come back, essentially you have the, f the sequential frame, um, and then the actual tracking states you know, of the actual joints. And these come back as indices of arrays of the skeletal information. OK, so what we're going to do now is, again, build on, uh, we're going to create a new application this time. Um, and I'm just going to um, use a clean, clean one, so runtime. And just create the new runtime as we did before, like that. Um, and we have, oh, I created it already. So there we go. And we're going to new e dot initialize. And this time, all I care about is skeletal tracking for this little application. Be good citizens and always uninitialize. Um, now, what we're going to do here is something slightly different. Um, so I'm going to create three little images like this. And this application is going to show you how I'm using those events from the skeletal handler. Um, and so what I'm going to do here is, let's see, D colon. Let's see where those image files are. So I'm going to put pictures of my hands as different parts. And also, I need to find where my, I put my head. 
Uh, let's see. And there's Gavin Head there. So I'll just add that here. Okay, just like that. Okay, so these are the different parts, and I'm going to call it image head. Image left and image right. Okay, so now I've imported those images. Essentially what I'm going to do now um, is create my little app which does the uh, rendering itself. So do set up my event, skeleton frame ready. And in here, I'm going to do something cute. Um, so I'm going to unpack the data from um, the actual thing itself. So uh, let's see. <coughs> so what I have to do is unpack skeleton frame from the events itself. So um, because we can track lots of different skeletons, uh, we have to unpack them. So what we've done is we've extracted all skeletons that are returned from the event arguments. Um, and then what we do is we extract the data um, from that set of arguments. So we do essentially in all skeletons dot skeletons. So we're enumerating skeletons where the tracking state of the skeletons are actually tracked. And um, select that skeleton itself and then say uh, first or default skeleton that you can find. Okay, so what we've done there is um, we're extracting the first skeleton that it can find. Now I'm going to create myself a little helper function here, um, which essentially is just going to set um, the position of my head or my arms um, from the tracked information. And so what we do is we just set image position. So on my image head, and then essentially oops, skeleton image head. So oh, I need to pass that in there, sorry. So what we need to do is we also need to scale those coordinates into, um, into screen coordinates. So I'm going to create myself a scale joint variable, um, which essentially I'm going to scale it to, let's say, 640 by 480 um, with a given point, you know, scaling factor. And as I'm doing this, you know, it's not my intention to bore you out of your skulls watching me um, coding here, but I'm trying to illustrate how quickly it is to create, um, you know, these applications. Um, So let's see, joint. J 
just like that. Okay. So then all I do here is, so this function just basically does a scaling of a given image thing. And so image head, and then I basically index um, the head. And some cut and paste here. Okay, let's see what we get. So they're my body parts. And once it starts tracking me, um, I've got a little bug in there. Let's have a look. <laughs> what would be software development with our little bug? Uh, did anyone see what it is? <laughs> I did the count. Oh, OK. Thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> that should be set top. Nice catch. All right. So essentially, what I'm doing is using skeleton data to manipulate my hand and my head and positional stuff like that. I could do other things such as legs and arms and so on. That's not the point of the demo. Essentially, what it's trying to illustrate is how easy it is to do something with skeleton data. Now, you know, as you saw, probably with the Connect launch, you know, someone had a motorized lounger and so on. What you could do is then do kind of hit testing, you know. So you could draw imaginary boxes you know, on the left and right hand sides, and when a hand goes into it, then you move the motor of something else to the right and so on. So it's really easy to create new applications by tracking where body parts are. Now you notice there's some kind of shuddering of my, hand, my left hand there. So there's another concept in Connect, which is called skeletal smoothing. Um, and what we can do is when you turn on smoothing, um, essentially, you tell this skeleton engine here, let's see, to turn smoothing on. Um, and what we have to do uh, is set up a bunch of uh, parameters here. So actually, let's just do transform smooth. There's many different control vectors that you can use to smooth the skeleton. Um, but now you notice there's no judder anymore. It's a lot more smooth in terms of um, how it's tracking my hands. Um, so if you turn smoothing on, uh, you get a lot more deterministic and intelligent predictive modeling of where the body parts are. So there's my little skeleton tracking demo. Um, so for audio, so inside of Connect, as I said before, um, there's four microphones um, in the device. Um, and so there's actually some very powerful things on the hardware, such as the multi-channel echo cancellation, um, but also um, sound positioning. So this is a concept called sound source localization. Um, and because there's four microphones, if I stand to the left, it's going to take a small delta of time longer for the sound from my voice to go to um, the microphone on the right-hand side or set of microphones. So because of that, as I move around, um, it's possible for the device to basically localize the angle of which I am from the front of the device. And that's called sound source localization. Um, and then there's some very powerful noise suppression and um, echo cancellation capability in the device itself. Um, so it's a very good mic, and probably one of the best mics you can buy for $150. Um, you know, for echo cancellation um, and gain control. Um, but also, it's f because of that, it's also very good for speech recognition because it's filtering out all of the garbage that the PC might be playing and also ambient sounds and stuff like that. Now, because we're in, we may be probably doing a multimodal-like scenario, so we're doing both NUI and also speech, we want to give, um, you know, users of the Connect scenario applications, um, 
modal information about um, now is the time that you can use this word that, and that kind of thing. So, you know, on the Xbox console you have a little mic and you may give a person a hint. So this is the kind of thing that we want to do is when we develop these um, new applications which are multimodal is to give users, you know, some hints and tricks in terms of um, how to interact with the software created. Um, for speech recognition, so we use the Microsoft Speech Platform and we have what we call a grammar um, which is specially tailored for Connect, um, which you download um, in addition to the SDK. And a grammar um, essentially is um, a definition, uh, obviously, of recognized words, but also what it confirms, uh, corresponds to. So clearly, on the left-hand side, it's a simple yes, no grammar. Um, and then it has a rule, URI, which you know, corresponds to a confirmation. Um, but also, the grammar can also do more advanced stuff, such as, you know, yes is obviously a lot of different things. Yeah, yep, okay, mm -hmm. uh, that kind of thing. So the grammar is a definition of what the speech recognition engine has been trained on. So for the Connect one, you know, there's you know, a very wide grammar um, of recognizable words, specifically tailored for the device. Um, so I'm not going to go too much into this. Um, because our subsequent speakers, Eric and Carlos, are going to be able to uh, take you into that in further detail. But I will show you a very simple application, um, which is part of the Connect SDK um, for audio. So it's the record audio sample, and it doesn't get simpler than this. Um, let's remove that window there. So in a similar way as the new applications, we use the audio namespace. Um, and essentially we say, you know, we create a new audio source from the Connect device. Um, and you can set up properties such as, you know, um, number of bits per, you know, audio sample, you know, uh, capture frame uh, sample rate such as 16 kilohertz to uh, 32 kilohertz and so on. Um, and essentially what you do, so this application actually both records the sample streams coming off the device um, and also shows you an angle beam, and I'll show you in just a second. Um, but in terms of the raw fundamentals, um, essentially create the audio source, you tell the audio stream to start, and then you just get the data off, you just do reads into your buffer of that. And that's essentially it. I mean, to get audio off a device, essentially in three lines, um, or four lines with a while loop, I mean, it's just phenomenal. The C++ version of this, I will show you it, um, is quite horrendously more complex. Um, it really shows the power of you know, these uh, more modern day languages. Um, and, and also what we do here is we get the, um, the sound source localization beam um, which is the beam angle coming off the device itself. So if I run this, um, essentially showing the different angles coming off the beam itself. Um, and at the same time, it's also recording me speaking into this thing. Um, so let's uh, close this. Um, and it would have created essentially a file in there. So let's quickly go to the C++ one to see what a world of difference it makes um, using C++. As I said, it's quite horrifically different. Um, so essentially, you have to get the device name using you know, various um, DirectX structures and opening property stores and setting properties and so on. I think I would prefer the five lines of code myself. Um, so that's the audio part. Um, now you probably all saw speech uh, shape game. Um, so let's open that up and show you a little bit of shape game. So which is in my libraries. So these samples are all available um, in our SDK.
So I'm sure you saw this the other day, this guy doing this thing, and he also responds to speech. So pause, pause game, continue, continue. It'll eventually continue. Um, so <coughs> what I can do here is actually just give you a little glimpse into um, how the voice, the speech works. Um, now Carlos can go into this much greater detail later on um, than I can or are willing to. But essentially um, what I'm doing is I'm setting up my dictionary, which the grammar of the SDK, um, the speech SDK, the special part that um, we created for it, the connect grammar, we're going to respond to. So essentially I want to respond to you know, bigger, bigger, smaller, and so on, specifically for this game. So I'm setting up a dictionary in my application here um, of these actual verbs and nouns which go into the um, speech engine saying I want to re recognize smallest. And then I'm saying um, this is my internal control constant so that when smallest is recognized then it gives me this internal constant verb. Similarly with shapes, you know, colors, um, and then the verbs themselves, such as, you know, uh, for instance, resume will be unfreeze, resume, continue, play, start, go, and so on. So what we do um, is so that connect grammar has a specific string identifier, which is that lovely thing there. And what we do is we, um, so this is part of the Microsoft Speech namespace, so Speech Recognition Engine. And I'm saying, give me the recognizer information for that you have registered speech engines um, with this recognizer ID, which is essentially the connect one. And then what I do is I create the spec spe speech recognition engine. And then what I'm doing is I'm creating my simple grammar of shapes, colors, and so on. And I'm adding them to the grammar, which I eventually um, add into the speech recognition engine. So I'm loading that grammar that I created. I'm adding events, which is fire an event when you recognize you know, a give, you know, any verb or word that's in uh, that grammar. Um, and also tell me if anything's been rejected. And so uh, this, D this start DMO, essentially what we do is just like that audio sample in C Sharp that I showed you before, um, you obviously have to pass the connect audio stream into um, the speech recognition engine. So in this scenario, what we do is we create that audio source like we did before, and we set up a little more control information uh, this time around. So um, what we're doing is we're saying we want you know an Opti beam coming off the device itself, the audio device. Um, and we're not turning on echo cancellation because echo cancellation requires something to be coming out of the speaker. So for simplicity in this demo in the SDK, we didn't have echo cancellation turned on. But that would require you to have to also um, control what's going out all the time um, of the, the speaker on the device. So then essentially we set the parameters up in terms of um, sampling rates and so on. And then we tell the speech engine to recognize you know, samples until I tell you to stop. And then essentially what happens is when it recognizes um, a verb in the grammar that you set, it fires an event. Um, and essentially we say you know, it recognized this text. And what we do essentially is we look in our dictionary and we say, well, if there's a shape, you know, uh, sound that's recognized, and we found a color in there, then what we do is we fire this to the, the game application side of things. Similarly, you know, if it's a verb to restart and so on, we stop and start the game. So essentially, that is it. There's a lot of resources on the internet that we provide um, in terms of samples, the SDK itself, um, and also Channel 9 and Coding for Fun have a lot of great samples and um, things that you can leverage to create uh, very quick and powerful NUI and multimodal, including speech and audio connect applications. And as you saw, I mean, even with the goof before when you know, I couldn't 
get my sample adapted any further. I just started from scratch and within a few minutes I'd recreated the whole thing again in you know, literally half a dozen lines of code. Um, so it's just, with the power of Visual Studio, you know, it's phenomenally easy to create, you know, very powerful Connect applications. Even the silly head and two hands thing, you know, it, you can easily do kind of area um, hit testing of left hand in, you know, right hand side, then you can, you know, uh, create powerful new scenarios that way. So with that, I conclude the talk. Any questions that anybody has? I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hi, that, that was um, very interesting. Uh, can you tell me how difficult is it to run this from XNA? Um, so I actually believe someone has created an XNA sample um, which uses Connect. Um, they did that leading up to our launch and we didn't include that as um, a sample app. Um, but someone has actually done it, so. Okay. Yes. Ah, someone's going to run. Thank you for your great talk. What about tuning for different lighting conditions? Have you looked at that? Are there any libraries for that or any tricks of the trade? Mm, it depends what you mean tuning. So, um, so the depth camera in the Kinect can work in pitch black room because it's in the infrared spectrum. Um, so but if it's in bright light, it'll often wash out. Yeah, so it depends again. So it depends how, so the VGA camera, obviously like all cameras, you know, susceptible to low light and, you know, washing from overexposure. The depth camera, um, you know, uh, we haven't found anything, you know, in our testing, you know, in the building, you know, that has affected skeletal tracking. Um, you know, and Connect's obviously used in, you know, all manner of scenarios. So um, I guess at the extreme end, you know, if I had the sun shining at me from a few hundred yards, then obviously it's going to obliterate the ability for those infrared bounces to go back to the sensor. So. I know much tuning beyond what the Kinect's capabilities are, one can actually do, not algorithmically. I think it comes to physical science where those limitations occur. Thank you. Um, thank you for the very good talk. So we have uh, seen that the calibration of the different devices, the shift a little bit, you know, from one connect to another. So, uh, uh, how much is the shift, and is it necessary to recalibrate when you? Yeah, connects out of the box. They, for the most part, don't need to be calibrated. Um, you know, of the several dozen that we've used during the development in those, you know, four months, essentially, we didn't have to calibrate the connect in any way. So I think out of the box, you know, you don't need to go through any calibration. I think one of the beauties of the Connect is, you know, it just works out of the box. So that was one of the, the primary aims. Um, uh, I haven't heard of any instance where there was a bad Connect that needed to be calibrated. Um, you'd have to ask the Xbox team what those calibration cards are for, but I've never used it either at home or here at work, so. Um, can you, tell the, um, the microphone to look for a specific person? No, so it, you can't tell it because... Um, I mean, if I know where, let's say I'm doing a skeleton tracking, right? I'm tracking somebody's skeleton, and I, so I know where their head position is. And you've got beam forming, so it knows a direction, right? So in theory, I could say, all right, beam form, I want you to point to this person's head and only listen to that person? Yeah, so you can steer the beam. Um, so you have to tell the device where to steer the beam. Um, but then if the sound moves, essentially 
it can't track you because then it's going to need to know voice characteristics and that kind of stuff. So that's beyond the capabilities of our SDK. Is that, that's beyond the capabilities of the SDK, but is it something that could be supported in the future? Well, given that it's in the audio spectrum, I guess it could be. Um, I don't know of any plans um, to actually do that, is okay. speaker identification. Because, I mean, well, so far in our experience, um, you know, the, the microphone works very well. You know, we can play, you know, like, uh, a song and then have it recognize someone. But it does recognize, um, you know, uh, noise from other places. So if, if I'm giving a demo and I've got four or five people in the room and we're talking about it, sometimes the, the speech recognition will react from someone just talking about something over on the other side of the room. Now, we're not using any um, special commands to initiate the No, sound, that's true. Actually, so ask Carlos, who's coming up in the next session. He was the guy, my engineer who basically did the audio port. Um, so he can probably fill that in better for you. OK, yeah. thank you. Uh, in terms of the architecture slide that you had, there is obviously segmentation happening in, in the system to, to distinguish one skeleton from the other. Right. So where is that happening? Is, is that uh, in, in your hardware, in so your architectures? So stack? that part itself, let me just fly back here. So that is in the, the new API there. So new API is actually a runtime itself, which is continually getting data off the Connect device. The Connect device basically returns raw data off the sensors and returns them, returns them into the PC. So Nui API is, is where all the magic happens in terms of player identification and joint tracking and in, interpolation and so on. So that's all the magic happening is in MSR Connect, uh, Nui.dll. Call the runtime already the code for that would that. You're right, exactly. Right. Okay. Uh, and uh, how would I know how much uh, CPU is being used up for that? Is there a mechanism? Um, well, so it's straightforward enough. You right click process uh, task manager and have a look um, of what it's consuming. Um, on average, um, with the two full players, um, it depends on how many cores you have on your machine. Um, but it's no more than around 50% of a single core itself. But because most machines now multi-core anyhow, it looks a lot less, like 25% or so on. So um, you know, it's very lightweight impact on the system when one considers how much computation is actually going on. And you know, as you know, the SDK gets refined, you know, you know that number itself is going to go dramatically down. Because right now, we're running all on the CPU itself. Um, and actually, quite a bit of code could be put onto the GPU. Um, and when we did the port from Connect, so Connect it, uh, from the Xbox console, you know, it shares you know, running execution of code on the GPU of the console device itself and also the CPU on the device. Um, just because of the time constraints um, and architectural differences, we did it all in on the CPU, on the PC. But in future releases, you know, we'll continue to refine uh, the impact it has on the system in terms of computation, and it will definitely go down. So if somebody is wearing um, sort of a gown or a mask or something like that, there's a chance that your skeleton tracking may go wrong because some segmentations may go wrong. Is there a way to disable this? Or uh, let's say if you use the C ver the C++ version, uh, you necessarily have to incre incur this overhead. Is that, is that true? Well, the overhead's so negligible. So let's, let me bring up um, my sample application. Uh, not audio capture, but the original. So let's see. So if we look at skeleton viewer here, so this is the full-blown thing. You know, and if we look at performance, so, so you know, it's doing full-blown skeletal tracking, you know, and it's around 30% CPU. Um, and that, so this is in C sharp. The C++ one uses less because we're, uh, oops, I don't want to shut down. 
So if we go to sample skeletal viewer, the C++ one is less. Um, my legs are doing some funny things there. So it is less because there's you know, much less overhead. So this is around 21%, C 21, 25% CPU um, to do that. So yeah, I'm, I'm not so much concerned about the CPU as much as when does it go wrong. So if, I, if you were to wear a gown, you know, like a... Oh, uh, why does uh, it And go so wrong? I want to do my hand segmentation, for example. Uh, yeah, so the Connect console itself has been tuned with millions of data points in terms of people with hoods and caps and tall people, short people, round people, skinny people, and so on. Um, teenagers with dreadlocks and long hair and short hair and no hair. And so it's been very highly tuned for the consumer scenario. And there were, you know, well over a year of um, data collection of um, people playing this, you know, in all the various guises that people dress up and so on, such as skirts and shorts and so on. So it's extremely robust. Um, and obviously over time, things are just going to continue to get more robust and so on. Um, but I think, you know, given the, the sheer size of um, the data sets that the Connect team over the last several years in the Xbox team has been working on, um, no one can really match you know, the data sets and, ro and robustness of this that's out there. I mean, it's pretty two phenomenal. Hold hands. Sorry? If two people were to hold hands and dance around, you think it'll get two different people? It would, if I'm, if I'm brave enough to hold Stuart's hand on stage. Uh, exactly. But you know, it's, uh, yes, it can distinguish between the two. Um, even kids and so on. I mean, in the gaming scenario, it can track, you know, several people in a home scenario of grandma and small kids, so. Um, I'm wondering if, he, if there's any plans to add the uh, face mesh from Video Connect to the SDK. So face mesh, is that a Microsoft? Nothing announced. Okay, nothing announced. That's the answer. <laughs> Uh, I have a question here. Oh. Is, is there somebody asking? Somebody, me or who? Who wants to go? <laughs> Anyone who's next. <laughs> All right. Well, then I guess I'll go. Um, number three, four. four. All right, four. Go ahead. Four. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, I was looking for um, medical applications, and in particular for cerebral palsy and so on and so forth. So I did, just did an uh, internet search. Lots of people are complaining about wheelchair coming in the way. So if somebody is sitting on the wheelchair, they are not correctly done in the skeleton. Is that correct still or is this something old? Well, so it really depends on, you know, limbs and so on. So this is, so Microsoft is working on obviously future releases of Kinect um, and it's optimized and these algorithms are taken from the console. So it's optimized for the consumer home scenario set of algorithms. So, you know, I'm sitting here and it's found me. Um, but, you know, as I get shorter, then, you know, my leg is not doing that, I can tell you that. <laughs> uh, but we are working, you know, on the algorithms, you know, for skeletal tracking um, in different scenarios. So, um, their scenario will be catered, you know, definitely much better in future releases um, um, because obviously we want connect and connect on you know both on the console and on the PC platform to work in all manner of scenarios but it just happens that this first one is for essentially standing or living room seated scenario so that you know those scenarios will be covered in future releases um, I guess they're more of comments than questions or suggestions. Um, the first one is um, joint angles. Uh, do you think you might be releasing a, a version with, that gives you the access to the joint angles? Yeah, I don't have any insight into that. Um, we essentially did the engineering for the PC port. We don't really work with the Xbox team knowing you know, what their future 
enhancements are going to be. Yeah, so I don't. The joint angles can be, I mean, they can be extremely useful in a number right. of different applications. Yeah. The, the other thing, I guess, is also with, uh, you know, people are talking about different ways or different scenarios for the skeleton tracking. One of the things that we found is if you turn around 180 degrees, it'll flip the skeleton back. Mm -hmm. So if I was using this in a head-mounted display, for example, and I'm turning around, it won't, you know, it won't get the tracking right because it'll actually flip it. So I was just wondering if there's anything parameter that you could tune that would tell it not to do that. Yeah, I'm personally not familiar. Maybe ask Eric, who's up with Carlos in the next session, if, if they know. Okay. Um, so I probably have another time for one more question. When you, hi, when, up here. When you turned skeletal smoothing on, it appeared that latency went up quite a lot, which I guess is a necessary component of putting smoothing on. Yeah, so is this application here, this is skeleton smoothing on, so I don't know, is, is there latency there? I mean, I can't tell what's latency from the camera going through USB and being rendered versus the smoothing, but I don't think there's much latency. Um, I think it's essentially negligible. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess the uh, a second very quick question is, you know that, that the skeleton is constrained in certain ways, yet it seems that the models you have built into the NUI aren't uh, attending to those constraints. So I can see your limbs doing things that are physically impossible when it, when it reaches an error state. Yeah. Uh, well, so one thing that I'm not doing in this application is looking at that track state. Um, so then something I was playing when I was creating this sample application in the SDK was to not show limbs that, didn't, that weren't being actively tracked. Uh, but I thought it would look a little silly um, if I just had hips and no, and no limbs. Um, so I turned that off again. But you can actually, based on those three states, um, and there's also a confidence value of that joint too, um, you can do more, um, let's say, meaningful stuff. So, you know, if my, my left hand is starting to wobble on the left for no apparent reason, you know, probably the confidence value is low and um, you can actually get that out of the data. Okay, really exciting. I can't wait to give it a go. Great, thanks. All right, I think that's it. Thank you, everybody.